All right, looks like we're alive now. Oops. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Newman with the Cloud Security Alliance DC chapter, and welcome to our monthly webinar series on cloud security with uh, CloudNox. Before I uh, get to introductions, though, I'd like to do a brief intro on Cloud Security Alliance. Um, we're the world's leading organization dedicated to defining and raising awareness of best practices for securing cloud computing. And uh, Cloud Security Alliance DC harnesses the subject matter expertise of industry practitioners, governments, and our corporate and individual members to offer cloud security education, research, certification, and events like this webinar series. Um, and so CSA is a nonprofit organization and CSA DC does run on volunteers. So uh, if any of you are interested in volunteering and continuing the work of promoting cloud security issues, then please contact us through our website. And so Cloud Security Alliance, our parent organization, works to build best practices. Um, and like I was saying, we are a global non-for-profit conducting research and educational programs into issues of cloud security. And today there's over 100,000 members in CSA globally with over 100 chapters. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, first and foremost, CloudNox, um, for helping us put this together today. Um, and also our partners, ATARC and ISACA and Leadership Connect. And so let me introduce then uh, Mike Rago uh, from CloudNox. Mike has over 20 years of security research experience and his current research focuses on hybrid cloud security risks and threats. And he's contributed to various security publications and is the author of books such as Mobile Data Loss, Threats and Countermeasures and Data Hiding. He's also a frequent presenter at security conferences, including Black Hat and DEF CON, as well as DOD Cybercrime. And so with that note, uh, let me turn it over to Mike. Great, thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Thanks for having me. Let me go ahead and share out my screen. I'm gonna turn off my camera just so we uh, can go ahead and share out these slides. So bear with me for a moment. And then just let me know if you can see the slides. Uh, yep, we sure can. Great, let me go ahead and go to uh, full mode. Okay, great, so we'll go ahead and get started. So thanks again for having me. We're really excited to present today. Uh, we are frequent presenters uh, with the Cloud Security Alliance, having presented to other chapters out in the West Coast, um, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Florida locations and, and otherwise. And uh, the topic today is cloud infrastructure uh, cyber kill chain. And we'll talk about cloud infrastructure, incident response and forensics and aspects of that. Uh, my name is Mike Rago. I work for CloudNox uh, as one of the uh, security folks here and work quite a bit with uh, many of the organizations that we conduct risk assessments for. So a lot of the content that we'll cover today uh, will we'll bring forth you know, a lot of those types of findings and you know, the, the types of things that we uncover in doing these risk assessments and many of the things we see across AWS, Azure, GCP. And uh, interestingly enough, we, we um, as a company also support VMware, uh, both in the cloud and, and on-prem. So there may be a little aspect of that too. So uh, before I continue, just a quick sound and visual check. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep, we certainly can, Mike. Okay, great, thanks. So I don't usually like to talk too much about myself, so I'll leave this as a backdrop and tell you rather a little bit of a funny story how I got into cybersecurity. 
Uh, and I think that'll play in very well with the, the, the rest of the presentation. Um, I, uh, I cut my teeth on security while working at NASDAQ about 25 years ago. Uh, and when I joined the NASDAQ stock market, um, I was a Unix system administrator and an Oracle DBA. And at that time, um, you know, we're, we're managing the environment, doing lots of various things. And, you know, I was always one of those folks that liked to tinker around with things. And at that time, uh, there was an individual by the name of Dan Farmer uh, who was one of the early, you know, ethical hacking cybersecurity researchers of that time. Uh, Dan presented at DEF CON 1. Um, he's got a lot of experience in this realm. He's been around for many, many years. And I had gotten uh, the, the most recent um, uh, Information Week magazine and saw that this guy on the cover and was inspired to read the article about how he had a variety of tools for assessing environments. And mind you, this is like 1994, right? And, um, you know, he had a tool called Satan, which interestingly enough, which was really a security assessment toolkit. And um, at that time, it predated things like Nessus or Qualys or Tenable and all those other tools that are out there. And uh, was really kind of um, groundbreaking in terms of using tools to assess the environment. So I downloaded this tool, I ran it full bore, uh, on the NASDAQ network uh, in the middle of the day on the trading floor and took down the stock market. So obviously it wasn't one of my better days, um, but uh, you know, good thing was NASDAQ was doing virtualization long before the term had even been coined. And so we had full backup, fully recovered. There was no interruption to a single trade, which was a good thing. Um, but the flip side of it was I was probably on the verge of being fired. And I got called into the CISO's office, although they didn't call them CISOs back then. They were, uh, this guy was the VP of information security. And he sat me down and he said, Mike, you've got one of two choices. You're either fired or you can take a promotion. <laughs> so I took a promotion, asked questions later, and he essentially said, listen, we don't have anybody on the team today that thinks about protecting the network from a hacker perspective. You know, you clearly demonstrated you can take down the network. Now it's gonna be your job to build out a team to protect it. And that was essentially how I got into cybersecurity, which was actually by accident. So, but there's an interesting theme behind that. And, you know, as we start to take a look at um, cloud security, uh, more and more additional depths, you know, more broadness from many different perspectives, there are commonalities with back then how we managed and secured networks versus how we do it today in a virtualized cloud world. Um, and you know we'll, we'll talk about a lot of that as we go through the presentation. On a side note, just two slides on CloudNox. Um, we, we essentially provide permissions management in the cloud across AWS, Azure, GCP, and even VMware. We uniquely do this by monitoring activity that is going on. So rather than just take a snapshot of your you know, current permissions, identities, and their access to resources, we're balancing that with activity to say, did you realize Jane has 9,000 permissions in AWS, but is only using 1% of those? And that's exactly how we look at each and every environment when we do a risk assessment, is to find that distinction and use that to not only provide deep insights into your security hygiene, whether it be how over-provisioned are identities, whether they're human or service accounts, or furthermore, who possesses high-risk permissions, such as a super admin, root, super user type thing. And that brings forth a lot of analytics and we help customers right size through our automation and remediation, which takes that calculates lease privileges and allows you to assign new policies as they may be related to roles, serverless functions, identities, and more. All right, so let's dive into the presentation. As I mentioned, we do a lot of risk assessments day in and day out working with many organizations. And my, my prior background is incident response, forensics, and many other aspects of cybersecurity. So, at the end of the day, when we think about you know, a cloud infrastructure, we think about incident response and forensics, we think about the cyber kill chain, the, the pointed question here is, what am I looking for? And where do I start? 
certainly the, the state of cloud security today has led to a lot of breaches. And those breaches are becoming more and more sophisticated. It's interesting that today I'm presenting to the Cloud Security Alliance because uh, the Cloud Security Alliance authored what I think is one of the most helpful and prominent uh, um, infographics and white papers around this where the Cloud Security Alliance broke down 11 recent uh, cloud breaches and the tactics, techniques, and procedures used by the attackers to perform those attacks. Um, and it's something I highlight in all the presentations that I do, whether it be at DEF CON, at other uh, security groups, uh, or other conferences around the world. Um, so I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, white paper, and I'll actually highlight it here in the slides. Uh, we'll also go through uh, a kind of a cloud infrastructure cyber kill chain. Cyber kill chain has been around for a while, but what's different in the context of the cloud and cloud infrastructure? We'll talk about that more because it should provide hopefully prescriptive advice in terms of how to look at the problem, but yet in a different way. And we'll also map this back to what I believe is proof is in the pudding, right? And break down a variety of recent breaches and through a variety of walkthroughs so we can break this down for you. And then we'll talk about a variety of approaches uh, across AWS, GCP actually, uh, Azure, um, and then we'll wrap up with more sources and information. We will cover a lot of content in this one hour. Um, we could certainly cover an entire week on this topic. So hopefully you'll enjoy the, the fact that there's a lot of content mashed up into an hour, um, but certainly we, we could talk about this for an entire week. So what am I looking for? One of the interesting pivotal points that we see in the industry is a lot more around behavioral analytics and UBA. Um, and a lot of that has to do with trying to identify when I see a huge uptick in activity related to an identity, whether that's uh, a human or a service account or a managed identity. And in looking at that and trying to identify those characteristics, that really implies I've got to have a baseline of what's normal so I can identify deviations to that. So we'll talk about some of those characteristics and what are the specific things I should actually look for that are very, very meaningful. In addition, you know, as I mentioned over the last 25 years, there's been a big change in how we manage and, and secure our environments. Today, people are talking about zero trust, least privileges, a lot of those things. Some of those are, you know, from... Uh, oh, Mike, yes. Uh, so I just got a text saying that uh, the presentation seems to be stuck. Are you moving past the... This is slide that says recent breach attack chain. It's been stuck there for a little bit. Okay. So you're not seeing the, the slides move forward at all? No, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, let me let me try something different then. Hold on just a moment. Stop sharing. Let me share in a different way and you can let me know if this works better. Okay. Uh, it actually doesn't because when you do that, you know, you get multiple images. Okay. So yeah, I think you have to go to the, either the, I think you have to either go to this uploaded slides or I guess possibly a screen share. Right. So bear with me, let me, let me do that then. Uh, so it looks like the uploaded slides are ready. So try that. Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. Bear with me just one more moment. I'm getting there. Okay, all right, sounds good. So can you see the slides now? Sorry. 
Yes, yeah, so we see the first slide, cloud infrastructure, cyber kill chain. Oh, there we go. It looks like it's moving now. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Sometimes uh, within Bright Talk, you don't always see what's being delivered on the other end. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so where we left off then, we we're talking about um, behavioral analytics, baselines, understanding um, um, you know, normal activity versus deviations to that. Um, the second aspect is, is that around um, understanding a lot of the different types of services that exist within the cloud. Um, you know, we may talk about uh, for AWS, EC2 instances, S3 buckets, DynamoDB, Elasticsearch. For Azure, you've got blobs, containers, instances. For GCP, you know, you've got uh, virtual machines and instances and more. And the nomenclature, while well, although it's different for the different cloud infrastructure providers, um, really means that these large quantity of services really need to be accounted for. Because when we think about protecting the environment, it's more than identities and their permissions. There's also the context of resources and understanding not only from an inventory standpoint, but who has access to what. And so we really need to bring that out and have a, a, you know, a detailed inventory of that too. The other thing is, as we think about how we access the cloud, you know, Again, dating back you know, 25 years ago, we would have a team that would deploy the servers, a different team that would deploy and set up the network, another team that would install the operating system, a different group that would install the database. As you start to think about that in today's world, across all of these different services, now within 15 minutes, I can spin up a similar stack in the cloud, virtualized and be up and running. So the pace at which we're moving in the cloud the availability of resources and who has that level of access to not only build, but tear down or destroy infrastructure becomes increasingly difficult to manage due to the pace and the accessibility of all of this. Also how we access the cloud um, has kind of uh, changed in a way too. We still have things like Secure Shell and, and services like that, RDP, but now there are you know, different types of command line interfaces. For example, AWS has its own CLI by which you can access and manage the environment. Also the credentials, when we think about AWS access keys, similar to kind of secure shell, if you will, where you've got a key and a secret key, but it's important to know that these things exist because if we're gonna protect the environment, we need to understand all the different methods by which people access the environment the authentication methods and schemes that are being used, the, the assets and resources in the environment, and so much more. Also, as we start to map out different types of permissions, think about you know, the quantity of permissions in these cloud service providers. You know, within Azure, we've got over 9,000 permissions. Within AWS, more than 9,600 permissions, the last I checked. And, and within GCP and VMware, uh, similarly as well. So does anybody really know what all of those permissions are and which ones present a high risk to the environment? Or furthermore, these things change daily. New services and functionality are added by the cloud providers every day, thus adding new permissions and tasks that are available to developers and other folks. So the environment's constantly changing. It's also growing like a carbon life form. And so these toxic combinations of these permissions can be really difficult to map out. Um, one of the fundamental things people do look at is trying to identify inactive accounts. And this can be really helpful in trying to do normal security hygiene. Um, um, but furthermore, when an inactive account suddenly becomes active and is used for a whole variety of activities, is that a sign of just a dormant user that's now using the account or that the account has been breached? And so these are things that also come into play, as does role chaining and cross account access. What we mean by this is if I'm in AWS, for example, and I have an account that lives within uh, um, you know, uh, one subscription or account, and that, that user then needs access to a secondary subscription or account, how can I provide that access to allow them to hop around? Within AWS, that's done using the SDS Assume role and policy that allows people to gain access to other types of environment. But again, it can become um, kind of like a rat's nest over time in terms of all this cross-account access and all these transient users. 
So understanding the risks always is, is fundamental to understanding how we're going to you know, approach this and remediate things. Uh, for example, um, when we look across all these permissions in the cloud, um, uh, you know, even for, you know, the three that we mentioned, GCP, Azure, and AWS, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, upwards of 30,000 permissions. Uh, and if you start to include others, you know, you're well over 40,000 permissions. Again, does anybody really, you know, understand the risks of all of those permissions? Which ones present higher risk versus others? Um, I, I'm constantly learning and I do this day in and day out across those three cloud service providers and I'm still learning and quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm anywhere close to that yet, which is why I use a lot of tools and automation for doing the things that we do. Furthermore, what we do know is that more than 50% of those permissions um, can destroy the, the infrastructure in some way, shape or form, which is kind of alarming, right? more than 4,000 of the 9,000 permissions, uh, more accurately, 4,500 or more, uh, could actually lead to you know, some method of destruction. That's quite scary. And furthermore, not only you know, the ability for mass destruction, but even just adversely impact the infrastructure, the ability to spin something down um, or change access to a service. More than 95% of the identities have a level of access that allows them to adversely impact the infrastructure. And the most prominent statistic that we find, less than 1% of the permissions for each and every user on average, less than 1% of the permissions are actually being used. So 99% of the permissions sitting out there don't need to be allocated because they're simply just not being used. And if they are gonna be used, then leverage your just-in-time access or privilege on demand rather than give users all permissions. So I mentioned I would, you know, highlight the Cloud Security Alliance paper here, you know, these top threats across 11 very prominent breaches. I, I make it a, a point to not really mention these companies by name, but what I will say is all 11 um, are either household names and or names we know very well within the security community. So these were all very prominent breaches. You might be surprised if you haven't looked at this, some of the actual companies on this list. But what we really want to touch on today is what is that, that systemic risk? What is that common thread across all of these breaches? There are lots of different TTPs that are mapped out extremely well by the Cloud Security Alliance. So kudos for this because I love to highlight this. It's um, People always ask me for a copy of this afterwards and I direct them to the Cloud Security Alliance website. But the systemic thread we see across all of this is over permissioned access. And really, that those 99% of permissions that are sitting out there across every infrastructure. So we do find that there are some really powerful commands. And there are a lot of simple one-liner scripts that could definitely destroy an important portion of the infrastructure. So again, the sensitivity of even the most minute task really needs to be understood in order to prevent what could potentially be a huge mass destruction of your infrastructure. If we start to map this out using a cyber kill chain, it brings out what is a little bit unique and different about the cloud infrastructure in this context. Where we find organizations today is they've shored up some level, generally speaking, they've shored up some level of perimeter protection, right? They've gone out there, they may be using an assessment tool, uh, a posture management tool, a perimeter tool that is really kind of um, looking at that first barrier. Do I have anything exposed to the outside world and should it be exposed or not? And what level of encryption is being used or not? And, and a lot of those you know, perimeter types of things. Cloud is so sophisticated though, right? And as we start to think about this problem, um, there are so many facets and layers to it. I find it analogous with, you know, 20 years ago, I was teaching ethical hacking classes and traveling all over the place doing that. And one of the big questions I was getting at that point was, you know, thinking beyond the firewall. And people were saying like, hey, I've got a firewall in place. I'm protecting my perimeter and my website and the internal network. I got a DMZ set up. I've got NAT set up, all of this stuff. 
Um, you know, Mike, what are your thoughts on what you know we should do next? Since you teach all these ethical hacking classes every week to so many organizations, and you know that's where we started to talk about you know endpoint security, uh, antivirus, malware protection, intrusion prevention systems, malware detection systems, and all of those different additional layers of defense. I find we're kind of at that same threshold or, or pivotal point, you know, that kind of tipping point um, in the cloud where people are starting to think beyond that and say, I know I still have a lot of risk out here. And based on what the Cloud Security Alliance, you know, outlined, um, people are still getting breached. So clearly this is not enough. What we do see across these TTPs using the Cloud Security Alliance, you know, white paper and more is that we're in our second generation of cloud breaches. These TTPs involve exploiting a lot of the IAM permissions that are set out there and allowing over permissioned access to a plethora of resources. In addition, when an identity is breached, whether it be a human service account, managed identity or more, you know, what level of access available out there? And it's typically a very broad level of access because many times most organizations it's over permissioned yet largely unused. And it's at that point we've seen with many of the breaches that there are aspects of privilege escalation and lateral movement stemming from role chaining or cross account access, as we mentioned. Um, also, that role based access control, which may be largely based on manual assumptions based um, some security baselines it is not enough. Right. Um, it's a lot of it is really guesswork and kind of setting a baseline. It is due diligence but we can do better with the technologies we have today. And it's important to take note of, you know, some of the challenges that still exist in many of these organizations resulting in a lot of these breaches. And of course, the permissions can also be related to how this data can potentially be exfiltrated. Uh, uh, even with read-only access, right? Uh, an attacker can download and create an offline copy of the data. So if we break down a couple of these recent breaches, we'll take a look at one that was very prominent and then one that was a little less prominent, but also brings out things we've seen even in the Cloud Security Alliance report. This one uh, was related to a large financial services organization and following the, the exploit of a server side request forgery type of attack, once the attacker was able to assume an IAM role, um, uh, attached to the EC2 instance for this particular application, it was quickly uncovered by the attacker that a lot broader access was available to this particular role. Um, and as a result, that over-provisioned access allowed uh, the attacker to, to move laterally across the network and uncover more than 700 other S3 buckets that ideally the identity had access to yet had never used. Um, and it, as a result of that, in mapping this out, we found some interesting characteristics. One was not only did it allow the listing of those S3 buckets, but the ability to copy its contents and download that data. If you look at this from a behavioral standpoint, though, beyond the over permissioned access, there was a huge deviation in behaviors. So, for example, the attacker. Um, was using uh, an application that ideally was really just tied to one S3 bucket, yet had access to more than 700 other S3 buckets. So there was a huge deviation in behavior that, you know, up until now, you know, one S3 bucket, and then suddenly a huge uptick in access across 700 other S3 buckets. Additionally, a very limited set of permissions that had been assigned were being used, but secondly, now a huge uptick in usage of permissions as well. And there's so many other different ways you can look at this from a behavioral standpoint that may have helped this organization in terms of uncovering those risks. And as we all know, uh, this led to exposure of a plethora of customer records. Now, if we take a look at the underlying issue here and we take a look at a JSON policy uh, within AWS in this example, this stems from a lot of default policies that are sitting out there. For example, resource star, which effectively grants administrator access. And why did this occur then? Because of over permissioned access. As we've stated, many of the risk assessments we do for organizations uncover the fact that a lot of permissions assigned 
very few are actually used. So if you compare what's assigned to the actual activity that may exist within your Microsoft graph and Azure Active Directory graph, or that may exist within CloudTrail, Access Analyzer, Access Advisor, or in your uh, Google Cloud logs, it can expose what permissions are actually being used. And this same type of data can be used for behavioral analysis too. Now, if we look at a different type of breach, this was for a very prominent security vendor, uh, uh, one that, interestingly enough, also you know, builds and, and sells web application firewalls. In this particular instance, there were a couple problems that occurred. One was we had a developer that took their AWS access keys and embedded them in the code that they posted online within GitHub. And an attacker found that, you know, this code contained those AWS access keys. Uh, furthermore, uh, the developer had created a database snapshot of an RDS database. And this database um, was less protected or the snap. Mike, can you hear me? Uh, your voice just cut out. Hope if everyone could hold on for just a second, I think Mike will be right back. We're just having some technical difficulties. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Ah, there we go. Thanks, Mike. We can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. So in this particular incident, uh, we had, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, both AWS access keys that had been embedded in code posted online, attacker found that. Furthermore, we also had uh, um, the developer who made a backup or snapshot of the RDS database. And because the exposure of these AWS access keys allowed the attacker to gain access to the RDS uh, snapshot. Um, this exposed not only uh, user accounts and password hashes, but furthermore, the certificates and the relevant private keys um, used for those web application firewalls. So being a former employee of VeriSign, I would argue the bigger risk here was not you know, the user accounts and the password hashes, but those actual certificates and their private keys. Because with the private keys and that level of access, it's possible that you could decrypt uh, all of that data Oh, Mike, I think we lost you once more. So in terms of AWS access keys then, um, you know, best practice uh, well architected from AWS recommends that these keys be rotated uh, every 90 days. But again, when we do risk assessments for organizations we work with, we commonly find that there are a lot of old keys sitting out there that haven't been rotated. Now, this is a best practice, but you know, it's not a silver bullet, right? Um, it doesn't prevent people from you know putting this in code and posting it to GitHub. But the idea behind it is that in the event that that occurred, maybe hopefully because you're rotating keys, by the time those keys are discovered, they've been rotated and are effectively useless. So it's kind of a you know um, defense in depth kind of approach. Um, but it is you know a best practice. It is recommended by AWS that these be rotated every 90 days. And you can actually look at what keys are actively actually being used in your environment. We find that less than 50% of these are actually being used. 
But when they originally created the identities, the AWS access keys were created, but sit out there and never are used. So if you're not using some of those related to many of the identities, you can actually decommission these two. So I'm a, uh, excuse me, I'm a big believer in, uh, you know, providing lots of cool and interesting examples. So um, when taking a look at a lot of these, you know, permissions risks, um, you know, as we mentioned within AWS, for example, 9,600 plus permissions, and it can be really difficult to understand what they all mean. So here's essentially four examples. First, when taking a look at external access, a lot of times we'll refer to things as a security group. You can kind of think of this as a virtualized firewall policy. Um, and it may protect things such as an EC2 instance. Um, but what you may see here is that, um, you know, if I create an identity and I assign all permissions to that identity, I'm effectively granting that person to make changes to the firewall policy. So when you think about providing developers access, DBAs, other users of the application and, and the cloud infrastructure environment in general, would you want them to have the, the ability to change firewall policies? Ideally, that's probably something allocated to your security administrators or infrastructure folks, right? But clearly, you know, a small subset of your overall, you know, identity space and your identity and access management. But yet we find this frequently assigned to all users. Secondly, is that around, um, um, the ability to create another identity. Another default permission is IEM create user. This permission allows you to create another identity, essentially. So if I was a developer and I wanted to give somebody else access, I could use this to you know, give them access to the environment. Additionally, if I was an insider threat, ideally I wanna cover my tracks. So one way to do that would be if I had this uh, permission, I could create a dummy account and use that for doing nefarious things rather than myself. Um, I had a slight disconnect there. Uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yep, Mike, we can certainly hear you. Okay, Thanks. great. Thanks. Um, two other things then, lateral movement. So when thinking about um, lateral movement, um, one of the other policies that by default is usually assigned to a lot of folks is the IAM update assume role policy or SDS assume role. As you mentioned earlier, when we think about uh, cross account access, this is how that is defined. So if you're getting users this permission, you're effectively allowing them to actually update that assume role policy to change or broaden the level of access they have to do lateral movement across the infrastructure. And that's exactly how an attacker can use this. And then also when we think about privilege escalation, the IAM put user policy allows you to update an inline policy, um, which allows you to effectively do a whole variety of things, including giving yourself full admin access to an S3 bucket. Similarly, if we map these out for GCP, there are very uh, similar types of features. Obviously the nomenclature and, and how this is performed in GCP is a little bit different. But for those of you managing a GCP type of cloud infrastructure, I've mapped these out as well. And when we share out the slides, you can get a copy of those. We've also had a lot of questions around solar winds, and one of Microsoft's advisories, the key one actually around this said, you also need to look at Azure. So this is more than just looking at your on-prem Microsoft environment and exploitation of those servers um, by leveraging AD and Azure AD and pitting to the cloud can also allow them to do a variety of nefarious things. But again, if you're not looking at the activity and not looking at the permissions actively being used, you may miss the fact that there's an, um, an attacker moving around within your cloud environment. One of those, that they recommended that was at the top of the list was Microsoft uh, authorization role assignments right, um, the ability to adjust role assignments. Now, this is clearly a task that is performed regularly by administrators, but should other users have this level of access? Probably not. So if you see an identity, especially one that's not in your admin group, that is you know, leveraging this permission, it's definitely suspicious. 
So it lends credence to the fact that as you start to take a look at all this level of access, there's got to be a good way about pulling back that access. And if somebody needs a break glass scenario uh, or uh, they're going to be performing new types of functions, you leverage things like just-in-time access or privilege on demand to provide that access. So you also have attestation, audit trail, and the ability to monitor that too. So if we come back to where we started before we start to dig even deeper, you know, we talked about aspects of infiltration, privilege escalation, lateral movement, and exfiltration. We'll give you uh, further examples around that. Um, a lot of this uh, may stem from this over-permissioned access, understanding what all of these permissions mean, identifying those dormant accounts, understanding user behavior, finding those deviations, and so much more. But it's really difficult in the cloud to try to do this manually. I know, because we work with customers day in and day out that are trying to do this. We're a big partner with Splunk. We do a lot of cool things. We've got a Splunk app. But you know, whether you're looking at native cloud trail logs, Microsoft Graph, or Azure Active Directory Graph logs, or things in Splunk, I mean, there's so many different permissions to try to understand that it can be really, really difficult. And because these operate in different ways for different clouds, if you've got a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud environment, your level of sophistication now grows exponentially. So it does require a lot of deep knowledge. I try to learn every day because I have to support all three. And it can be quite daunting. So trying to leverage you know, where you've got tools and automation to really figure out and identify those needles in the haystack is increasingly important. So what are sources of this data? How can I investigate things? How can I do instant response? How can I just see the suspicious activities that are going on and use that activity to better right size access within my environment? Sources of that information may include things like CloudTrail, Access Analyzer, Access Advisor, CloudWatch within AWS. Um, and as we mentioned, Azure, beyond Azure Active Directory Graph and Microsoft Graph, you also have Security Center. And then, of course, within GCP, you've got those relevant logs. There's also a lot of open source and commercial tools to help as well. But the key ingredient here is understanding activity and being able to pull those needles out of the haystack to figure out where to prioritize and focus your efforts. So hopefully, we gave some examples for AWS and where to focus you know, efforts key ingredients to look for, things of that nature. So let's talk a little bit more about CloudTrail and give you an actual example. Uh, and then we'll pivot from AWS into Azure. Within AWS, you know, if you take a look at your event history stemming from your CloudTrail, you can see each and every event. It's not abnormal, though, to have over a million events a day. So just think about, like, how am I going to consume all that data and make sense of it? You could download this in a JSON or CSV format. And if I look at an individual event, how do I analyze this? If I look at this within a JSON format, some you know, simple characteristics I can look at to begin with. One is the authentication method. So in this case, is it, they're not logging in via the web browser interface, but actually using an AWS access key, because we can see the authentication method says access key ID not a username and password credential. Remember, when you're using AWS access keys, there is no multi-factor authentication. You've got a key and you've got the secret key, which is why hackers love to kind of target these. Additionally, I can see the event name. What's actually being performed? Um, and in th this case, I can see list buckets, which was related to your storage and S3 buckets within AWS. And I can also see those things we traditionally would look at from an incident response perspective, which is, well, what IP address are they coming from? And what are unique characteristics about the browser? So this is a legitimate event. Let's compare this to uh, one that um, is definitely suspicious. So here we have a similar event. It's using the same AWS access key. And it's performing the same function, list buckets. But now, in this very simple example, we can see it's coming from a different IP and via a different browser. And this is, I know, just a very simple and fundamental um, example. But again, if, if you've never really looked at these in detail in this type of format, 
again, we've kind of covered some really simple characteristics that you can look at. Another thing is, and the Cloud Security Alliance has been very prescriptive around this, um, and AWS has really embraced that, and that is the idea around a clean room. So if you've ever done incident response and forensics, uh, you know, we, we've seen CSI shows. Some of you may have, um, you know, uh, DFIR experience, right? And, and, you know, when we think about a clean room, you know, if you gather evidence in the field, uh, you bring it back to a clean room and you, you, you handle it in such a way that you don't contaminate it so it can hold up in court. Similarly with, with digital, you know, you'll make a copy of a drive, uh, of a laptop, of a mobile device, and do your analysis on that copy rather than the original, so it's still admissible within court. Now, similarly in the cloud, you can set up a clean room, and you can do this leveraging an AWS CloudFormation template. And this allows you to do forensics in a safe way in an isolated environment, but now in the cloud. So as you can see there, I actually highlighted the Cloud Security Alliance blog behind this. And this highlights how you can have snapshot volumes, uh, volumes, record the metadata and tags, and then leverage the ability to create a clean room, leverage the CloudFormation template, and actually perform your playbook in trying to actually perform forensics around it while preserving the evidence. And if you want more information, highly recommend, we're gonna provide you the slides. You can go to that link to get more information. All right. We're running short on time, so I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so let's talk about Azure. So within Azure, you have things like RDP, things like that. Uh, and you know now within the interface online, you can open up Bash or PowerShell uh, and do that directly through the web browser, which is quite convenient. This then allows you to bring up that command line so you can do a variety of activities. I know a lot of people prefer to use PowerShell and Microsoft provides a plethora of different types of scripts you can use for running quick things, cleaning things up, automating things, et cetera. It's important to know though, that when leveraging Azure Cloud Shell, um, that it may keep files uh, within your account, within your subscription. Uh, for example, if you're using the commandlets and you have errors, like you might have in a Linux system, you may have a history file, in this case, a .azure folder, where some of the stuff may get stored. So if you're running a, a commandlet um, and there are certain things you're typing in, keep in mind that that is stored uh, perhaps in some of those files. Um, there's a really good blog around the, that uh, available from NetSpy, and I provide the link for you. But a good example here is you know, if I've got an attacker that gains access to my Azure environment, that attacker is gonna potentially look uh, and open up PowerShell and attempt to look for these files. Here's one example of that. So this was a file that was, you know, created automatically. And here we've got the admin username and password. Well, although this is the not the identity that was actually breached, this now provides the information to perform privilege escalation and now log in as a super user within the environment. So again, some really sensitive data to be aware of that may be sitting out there, which is why leash privileges for each and every one of your identity is so critically important. Security Center has improved quite a bit. This may vary depending on the level of uh, subscription that you may have, like E3, E5, et cetera. Um, but the type of information you um, may have available to you uh, could be some of the information you see under threat protection that I've highlighted here, which are your most prevalent alerts. Uh, here we can see uh, failed secure shell, um, um, you know, other types of behavioral activities that may be going on. And if you start to drill down into these, you can see that there are a variety of brute force attacks uh, attempt to, or attempts that are, that are being performed, um, but yet failing. And you can continue to drill down into that to gain deeper insights into what accounts are they trying? Um, where is this attack stemming from? And other characteristics about the who, what, when, where, and why. So definitely some good information that is actually provided within Security Center. In this presentation, we don't normally cover um, Office 365 and Exchange online, 
but in light of all the recent activities um, and, and by, um, you know, uh, big demand, um, I do tend to spend one slide talking about some interesting characteristics here, and that is PowerShell. One of the things I find in working with organizations is that many folks are not aware that for every Exchange online user is also the availability of PowerShell, whether they're using it or not. Most organizations, when I make them aware of this, are just startled, like they had no idea this was the case. Now, PowerShell for your average user is limited to just their account. But keep in mind, that's a very powerful thing, even for an attacker, where they may say, I'm going to weaponize this account. I have the ability with PowerShell to you know, delete sent email. So if I use their distribution list, their list of contacts to send, you know, phishing links and other things to other folks uh, within the organization, that's ideally coming from a trusted source now rather than the outside. Furthermore, PowerShell will also allow you to delete those sent uh, uh, emails. And in addition, um, a whole variety of other characteristics they can do to both weaponize the account um, and you know, clean up after themselves as well. So if they read emails, they can mark them then later as unread, things like that. So the question to ask yourself is, would you want all users to have access to PowerShell? Because attackers, if they gain access to an account, are gonna probably try to leverage PowerShell to do a bunch of nefarious things. So ideally, Microsoft provides uh, a PowerShell script that does allow you to disable PowerShell for all your average users. You know, would you want people in accounting or HR or other groups to have access to PowerShell? We find 99.9% .9 of the people in the Exchange Online environment don't even have, are not even using PowerShell. So it's 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 likely you can disable it for most users. And then if you're looking for signs of this activity, um, you can leverage your unified audit logs. The problem that we also see with many organizations is that all of them have the unified audit logs enabled, but depending on your level of subscription, it's either set for seven days or 30 days. So if you're investigating something that's older than 30 days, or in some cases where it's only set to seven days, you're investigating something that's you know older than seven days old, you're not gonna have those logs anymore. So Microsoft does provide a PowerShell script also to allow you to extend that and store it to an Azure Blob container um, so that you can have logs you know, for years if you want. Um, and it'll constantly rotate that on a regular basis so you get beyond the seven or 30 days, which is actually the default. Um, most of the investigations I did that I came, uh, came into in, you know, before I started with, uh, with CloudNox um, really uh, had a lot to do with um, you know, a lot of people not even realizing that that was a problem. So you certainly want to look for a lot of those particular risks. So just to round things out then, um, and we can certainly open it up for Q&A as well, um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Uh, Scott Piper, one of the most prominent you know, security folks in the AWS uh, you know, world, has his own consulting firm. I think he may have sold it recently, I'm not sure. Uh, but he runs uh, FW CloudSec. Um, which is a great uh, kind of B-sides type of conference. Um, really, really great. He's got tons of great blogs out there. Rhino Security does a lot of reverse engineering around the breaches that we covered and many more. So if you like that kind of stuff, you get into reverse engineering, highly recommend their website. Um, with AWS, uh, we talked about the forensic readiness. Um, again, available through the Cloud Security Alliance. I've got the link right there for you. And then Azure... And, and Microsoft in general has this hacker hunting series. So you can go out there and, and actually pull that down too. Lots of cool videos out there. So just to kind of round this out, you know, we certainly want to think about analyzing, understanding activity, and really pull out of the woodwork where those high-risk permissions exist. We've given you four of those for each of the prominent cloud infrastructure providers um, to give you kind of a starting point. Interestingly enough, well, although that isn't a detailed list, not only are there products out there that can help you with that, but it gives you a good starting point. 
it's likely if you find those permissions assigned to an identity, they probably have a lot of other high risk permissions too. So it gives you a good starting ground to uncover who has those super user permissions that maybe shouldn't. In addition, um, understanding where they've been assigned in the relationship to policies and roles can also be mapped out too. So once you see some of those and you see who those super users are, is it stemming from a role and a, um, you know, incorrect policy or one that should be better right size or least privileged. And then also is, you know, taking a look at a lot of that user behavior. Um, a lot of products out there allow you to baseline on the activity to say, um, this is what I see the user normally doing and then alert me when I see a huge uptick in activity like we've seen with many of the breaches. And then of course, this is an iterative process rather than a set and forget. And I'll leave you with this lasting thought before we open it up. And this was from Stephen Schmidt, uh, the CISO at AWS, in a letter to a senator following one of the prominent breaches, actually one of the two we actually covered. And he states this, even if a customer misconfigures a resource, if the customer properly implements a least privileged policy, there's relatively little an actor has access to once they're authenticated, thereby significantly diminishing the customer's risk. So what we're talking about here is that iterative process, removing a lot of those unnecessary permissions to really reduce what many people refer to as that blast radius. Again, it's, it's a process, right, that you'll go through. As your environment grows, new permissions are added by the cloud infrastructure providers. As people are given access, people leave the company. This whole thing changes like a carbon life form. So, you know, many of the things that we've outlined today should hopefully help you start to build um, an approach and a playbook in how you handle that. So we'll definitely provide a copy of the slides. You can email me anytime, mrego at cloudnox.io. Uh, and uh, really thank you for your time today. I know we have a few minutes left, so happy to, to answer any questions you might have. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Mike. That was great. Um, and so if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Um, and then Mike and I can see them. And so it looks like we do have one from a couple minutes ago. So Mike, I don't know if you can see this one that says, um, we have Splunk, are there suggestions on how to use that to monitor these risks? Yeah, yeah. Um we work quite a bit with Splunk. They're, you know, for Cloudnax, they're one of our biggest partners, and we've we've got an app. But outside of you know what may be productized and available, and just if you're consuming CloudTrail or other things into Splunk, is to really try to uncover those activities. Um, there's a lot of data in CloudTrail, and a, a portion of that is related to you know, who's doing what, where, and when, and what permissions are being used, and what kind of resources they're accessing. Um, Splunk provides you, obviously, that deep search capability to find that. The key ingredient, though, to performing that is, you know, where do I start? What am I looking for? You know, what are a couple things I can use to get started? We outlined earlier, you know, things like IAM create user, put user policy, security group um, egress or ingress. Those are things that you can initially monitor to start to filter out. And Splunk does a really good job of allowing you to save that, dashboard that, or even start to leverage Phantom in terms of orchestration to really you know, remediate those things too. So we work closely with them. I have a lot of customers that use Splunk. Um, I've got one here in Atlanta uh, that is actually a, a global top 25 AWS customer, and they use Splunk for doing exactly that. And you know, we, we've worked with them quite a bit to be very prescriptive and how to look at some of those things that I just mentioned. Perfect, thank you very much, Mike. Um, and geez, we've got literally a minute, so I don't know if you have time for this one, but it, look, uh, it says, can you provide tips on how to remediate? And I'm not sure what that question actually means. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm guessing it's related to a lot of the, you know, permissions. So how do I like fix all of this? You know, um, you know, in, in terms of how we do that at CloudNox is we leverage that activity. 
So we see what activities people are using versus the permissions assigned. If that's less than 1%, we basically have a controller that will remove all those unused permissions to better right size the access for the user. And then the, in the event that that user needs additional access, Within our product, we also have uh, privilege on demand, um, also integrated with ServiceNow, that allows you to, you know, allow people to request access and, you know, full attestation, remediation, um, and an audit trail uh, around that too. But there are, you know, a variety of tools out there beyond just CloudNox, right, where you can leverage just-in-time privilege on demand type access, and and certainly gives you that that ability. So as you're pairing back permissions, also providing a programmatic way to allow permissions to be assigned as well. Got it. And maybe we can squeeze one more in. Um, sure. So Steve has asked, um, what basic forensic functions are run when creating an EC2 auto clean room? Oh yeah, yeah. That um, The short answer is it depends. So it, it can depend on both how you've configured your CloudFormation template if you've customized that or you've done that in Terraform. But then furthermore, as you're running that, you know what, what characteristics you wanna gather. Uh, what do we find that, that people are commonly doing? Well, they, they may have um, you know, a snapshot and then they wanna look at the characteristics to, to find out both from an infrastructure standpoint and then within the operating system, what, what things actually occurred. Usually the, the first piece of that, the infrastructure piece, gives you the initial indicators of compromise. Um, and then as you gather your, your image itself, you essentially end up with two key pieces of data, right? One is, you know, those key analytics that you've gathered from your logs. And then secondly, localized within the EC2, that operating system, any additional things that are been performed. So sort of a two-step process. Great, hey, thank you very much, Mike. I, we just ran out of time, but really I can't thank you enough for taking the time to present this to us. Um, I think this was great and it was very, very useful information. Um, so again, I'm going to take Mike up on his offer and repeat, if anybody's got questions, feel free to email Mike. Um, and if you're interested in volunteering with uh, Cloud Security Alliance DC, please do contact us through our website. Um, and again, thank you. And please join us next month for our next presentation uh, with Deep Instinct. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.